Liverpool Canal to bring you tonight's new north. They used to say that England's bread hung by Lancashire's thread. That was when the textile trade was the great money spinner of the British Empire. And the thread that carried the cotton, coal and iron was this, the Leeds Liverpool Canal. So busy they had to build it twice as wide as ordinary canals. And that's one reason why it's about to win a new lease of life and weave new life into Lancashire. Well, as we all know, King Cotton said goodbye and so did the Empire and our canals, like so much of the rest of the region, became overgrown and disused. But that is changing. There is a renaissance in the northwest of England, nowhere more so than in our canals and in the Leeds-Liverpool Canal. They're spending £77 million on the Leeds-Liverpool Canal project, a million pounds a mile. For the next 25 minutes, join us on this voyage down the 77 miles. Because over the next 10 years, certain stretches of this canal will be transformed into long, thin versions of the London Dockland development with fashionable houses lining the waterfront. In between, there'll be clusters of new workshops and offices to attract industry. And in the countryside sections, new hotels, restaurants and marinas to attract the tourists. Most of the investment money is coming from you and me, the taxpayers and ratepayers. But if all goes well, we'll get a grant from Europe and we'll get our money back. The whole financial package has been put together by Lancashire Enterprises Limited. They are the industrial wing of the county council and their chairman is Jim Mason. Currently the scheme envisages that 40 millions will come from the common market by way of the regional and other funds. Uh, the rest of it will come from uh, government through uh, direct land grant and uh, local authority in urban area money. And there's a considerable amount of that money coming into the northwest at the moment. Uh, in addition to that, you then put on the top of that private capital along with Lancashire Enterprises capital to get the initial return. So you're talking about, uh, I would say, somewhere around about 70% public funding uh, to about 30% private funding. And at the end of the day, the scheme is left with the private funders, including LEL, to get their economic return on the investment. Well, the whole concept is a bridge between public and private capital. This scheme, the regeneration of industrial buildings in the area, has got to be done in that way. There's no way that economically you can develop these projects just purely from private enterprise. They're old industrial buildings that have to be refurbished, and you've got to use derelict land grant money from the government, you've got to use inner urban area money, textile uh, fund money from the European common market, in addition to private enterprise money. And it's those sorts of packages which allow you to get an economic return uh, to private enterprise and indeed to Lancashire Enterprises. The plan only takes in the Lancashire stretch of the canal, of course. Yorkshire's not involved. We start our journey at the most westerly development in the plan. That's at Martin Mere near Ormskirk, the wildfowl reserve started by Sir Peter Scott. It's going to get a 600,000 pound visitor's lodge with 25 rooms and 100 beds built amongst the birds. The education officer at Martin Mere is Patrick Fishniewski. Well, we've got about 1,500 tame birds of about 130 different species. I suppose the most spectacular, the ones that a lot of people come to see are the flamingos. One of the most important of the future developments will be our hostel area, where we hope that people will not only be able to spend a day out here at Martinmere, but will be able to spend a week in the area, not just looking at the birds at Martinmere, but also looking at all the other attractions that West Lancashire has to offer. Travelling east, we sail into Britain's most famous example of the heritage industry. Wigan Pier is now a tourist resort. Visitors by the 100,000 pay 50 pence a head to sail through an area that used to be a music hall joke even before George Orwell wrote his book.
Just five years ago, Wigan Pier was just this bit of metal. This was the pier, a disused ramp for coal wagons. Now, Wigan Pier is a market for industrial nostalgia. To date, they've won six awards. Last year, they earned more than three quarters of a million pounds in tourism. It's a lot of heritage and a whole new industry born out of the old. Pier master Maureen Sharples. It's gone very well indeed. We had over half a million visitors during the first 12 months, and so far this year, our figures are up by about 23%, so we're heading for the million mark. Half a million visitors. What do those visitors come for to what was a rather derelict canal side in Wigan? Well, they come to get a glimpse into heritage. Wigan Pier is mainly about the year 1900, which is very relevant to an awful lot of people because it's how their parents or how grandma and granddad actually lived. So it's really to get a glimpse into the past and also to enjoy a nice day out. And this is people from the north of England. It's their past, but are you getting tourists from, from beyond England even? Oh, yes, tourists from everywhere. We get letters from America, from Australia, from all over the place, and lots of continental visitors as well. It is very popular everywhere. They come to the Heritage Centre, um, which is the way we were, and also across the water to the Trencherfield Mill, where they see the, the cotton mills in action again, as it was at that time. one of the very big ones. It's uh, 75 ton in weight, 26 and a half foot in diameter, and approximately 84 foot in circumference. And there used to be 54 ropes, cotton driving ropes on that wheel, when it ran as a mill, uh, and it ran at 68 revolutions per minute. And there's a revolution in the minds of tourists. They don't want sun and sand all the time. Now they're willing to pay to come and see the industrial northwest, and they'll come in greater numbers as the canal corridor is made more and more attractive. The facts are there to prove it, and the figures provided by Terry Parker, managing director of the Travel Trade Consortium, Group North. It's estimated that something like 10 million uh, visitors come into the northwest each year, of which perhaps three quarters of a million are from the are from overseas. Uh, those people generate something like. 40 million overnights in hotels and clearly about 600 million in uh, spending power. And certainly the trends are showing increases despite certain hiccups like American tourists last year. Um, one interesting fact is that Manchester Airport currently approaching 10 million passengers a year is expecting to have 20 million by the turn of the century. Now that means a lot of extra work, um, a lot of development in tourism uh, in, in the next 10 or 15 years. We're sailing on six different boats in the course of this odyssey down the Leeds Liverpool, and this is the oldest one, the Kennet, built 40 years ago, especially wide for this canal. It was once a wreck, but even wreckage can be turned to profit in the new north because now it's a floating exhibition centre. The Kennet in particular is a boat which was built in 1947 and carried general cargoes on the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. After a period of uh, working on the canals and general maintenance work, it then fell into dereliction, if you like, and it actually hit the bottom a few times and uh, sunk. So what we decided to do was uh, actually do it up and make it into a floating exhibition unit, if you like. And this is what it does now. It goes to rallies and uh, it goes to various events up and down the canal. We try and get people on it and we try and explain the story of the canal and try and tell them a bit about the, the future of the canal, the potential that the canal actually has. Even mud makes money. This clay pit at Bickershaw supplies the clay that lines all the canals in Britain. Without it, they'd run dry. And if it was blue clay, there'd be Mediterranean-coloured canals all over England, because canal water's actually fairly clean. It only looks mucky because it's shallow, and you can see the brown Bickershaw mud on the bottom. On our right, Pennington Flash. Old coal seams collapse, land sinks, and fills up with water. Now, ingeniously, the flashes are turned into water parks. 
there are a lot of activities that can be uh, fostered along the canal. It, uh, leisure activities primarily uh, through the countryside. The water areas, the many flashes which have resulted from mining activities in the past and always seem to be a bit of a blot on the landscape, are in fact now turning up trumps for the borough. They're golfing on the slag heaps, the relics of an industrial revolution. Mining subsidence means a lake, lake means leisure. People like to go sailing. We won't just be pouring public money into this canal and getting nothing back in return. Lancashire Enterprises Limited, or LEL for short, has a strong track record. In the last four years, they've invested 28 million pounds in hundreds of ventures. They've rescued or created 4,000 jobs and made a profit of two million pounds for the ratepayers. Near Chorley, we pick up LEL's managing director, David Taylor. What's the ratepayer in Greater Manchester, Merseyside, Lancashire, and the taxpayer here? What's he gonna get for his money? The ratepayer is going to first and foremost get jobs, that's, that's the aim of the project, is to try and generate employment. Um, and in, in addition to that, you'll get an improved environment, in addition to that, you'll get a more attractive place to bring people to come and work and live in. So the, the, there are a number of other spin-off benefits as well as the main employment benefit, but that's the main one. Why are LEL so involved in the project? What, what do they feel particularly good about? It? Well, I think the critical role that we can play is to try and bridge the, the public and the private sector investment requirement. Um, I think that the public sector on its own would find the, the project difficult to undertake. I think the private sector on its own probably wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. But we can mix the packages and bring together people in the right combinations and make the thing more attractive and that's, that's the particular skill that we bring to the project. What happens if the Europe money doesn't come through? We would still proceed with the project. We'd still package up what public money we have from local government and from national government. It would just be reduced. Couldn't that imply that what you're actually doing in the hope of European money, over-ambitious perhaps a little? I don't think, but, well, it's, it's over-ambitious, yeah. Would, if, if all of us said it, it wasn't over-ambitious in one sense, but then again, if we're not ambitious, we'll always just go on skirting around the real problem. It's a million pounds a mile, we can put a number on that. How many jobs? Um, we, we've already made some estimates and we're hopeful that the first, very first phase of the project would create in excess of 5,000 jobs. So we're talking in thousands. Um, we're not talking in bits and pieces. In some way, is this Leeds Liverpool Canal? I mean, we've heard of the, the wealth belt and the, the sun belt. I mean, is this going to be a belt through, through Lancashire and Greater Manchester and Merseyside or something that's really happening? This was Britain's original wealth belt, and we don't see any reason why, given the infrastructure that's here and the, and the possibilities that are here, that it can't be part of the second industrial revolution, and that's what we're aiming for. Just by Johnson's top lock at Wilton near Chorley, there's a classic example of how the plan will work financially. There's an old brewery stables that could be turned into a luxury hotel. At the moment, it's a hotel for chickens and sheep, kept by the farmer Tom Schofield. I did intend developing it myself, but through various factors, all my professional advisors say I was wrong in my head into thinking about it. They've been saying I've been wrong in my head for 40 years anyway, like maybe they're right, I don't know. The message is that when the capital costs are high, the risks are great, and they should be taken by companies like LEL, not by individuals. We've navigated now to Blackburn, and we're sailing into a lovely hidden harbour. This is a wall triangle shielded from the main Bolton Road near the Royal Infirmary. And this stretch of what looks like a shale beach is going to become the edge of a 30 million pound housing development. You'll have waterfront apartments and then hundreds of houses and shops stretching back behind them. The Nationwide and the Halifax are paying for it with encouragement from urban renewal. It's going to be a desirable place to live. But four locks later and two miles further northeast, we'll be seeing what could be the biggest challenge on this canal. The gentleman on the bicycle there is Neil Lindsay, the project executive of Lancashire Enterprises. And he's going to tell us what he's planning to do with the crumbling parade of warehouses known as Enum Wharf. 
here we are approaching what to anybody else would look like a piece of the derelict old north. But after two days on this canal, I presume that LEL and yourself, you're licking your lips over this building, am I right? Yes, right, there's great opportunities here which we're going to pursue in association with Blackburn Borough and the private sector. It does look a real mess. Tell me what you're going to do to it. Well, the, the proposal is to develop a business development centre, a, a series of complex of workshops, small offices, support services for new small companies to develop in this end of the building. The latter third we've leased off to the private sector who's going to take the initiative to build a pub and restaurant on the site. A pub. So, I mean, will, will the sale of booze down one end finance the more wonderful ventures up this end? The pub's really a public attraction to get people onto the site, to help these small companies develop by having people walk through the site, seeing their businesses in operation. Come and start a company yourself along this ribbon of water. Neil Lindsay stays on board with us as we chug into Burnley, past the Toll House Museum on the Canal Bank. The kind of development Neil's been promoting is called an enterprise centre, where small companies can start up with business advice and secretarial services provided. We're now heading for a group of flats and offices planned for an historic site called Slater's Terrace. Slater's Terrace is an interesting project being promoted by the private sector to develop a series of workshop and houses together. as a proposed £700,000 investment. It's quite a radical idea, so who came up with it? Rod Hackney, who's um, famed as the community architect. Prince Charles's pal, yes. That's right. It's his scheme, it's his company that's promoting this. His company is seeking a government grant to help pay for it, but he, he's put the project together. And here we're approaching the uh, houses and workshops, as they were. And now we're going to convert it back into that same process with the workshops on the, on the ground floor overlooking the canal and the housing above. We're now on what's called the Straight Mile, the aqueduct above Burnley, 50 feet in the air. From here, you can see the extent of industrial dereliction in northeast Lancashire. But you can see the potential as well. Jim Mason, LEL chairman, explains why the canal development can bring new prosperity. People like water. People are attracted to water. And we've convinced the common market that this is a scheme that is worth backing. Indeed, they're, they're saying in the common market in Brussels that this is one of the best regional development schemes in the whole of Europe. And they're instancing this as the concept of integrated development. So they believe in it, and we believe in it. So the canal banks are being cleaned up and the waterways board is dredging. If you ever wondered where supermarket trolleys finish up, they're at the bottom of our canals. And here's yet another source of investment. The Manpower Services Commission is paying for improvements to the Pendle Heritage Centre, which stands just a short walk from the canal bank. For an entrance fee of 75 pence a head, tourists can see how we used to live in Lancashire centuries ago, how we used to live with a bit of brass and quite a lot of cast iron. It was built originally in as early as 1450, but the, early, the, the, the first stone building to survive is the date of about 1590. And then since then, there's been, there have been various additions and alterations to it right up to the present time. The wall garden, this is really delightful, the place we're sitting in. <coughs> I mean, it does make you think you're in a different century. I mean, who's that? what idea was this? Well, the garden itself is yet another addition built originally as a small wall kitchen garden for the house in about 1780. So we've tried really to recreate the atmosphere of that and putting back all the original plants uh, that would have been found in the garden of that date. We're now moving east of Colne, up further into the Pennines towards Yorkshire. This is the end of the one mile long Full Ridge Tunnel, a very black home for thousands of bats.
Barn Oldswick, at the top corner of northeast Lancashire and the top corner of the canal in Lancashire itself. And as if to emphasize the importance of encouraging through the Leeds Liverpool Canal project, not just leisure and recreation, but also industry. Well, Barn Oldswick is already home to two of the major British industrial names. Behind me here, Rolls-Royce. They have two factories in the town. They do a lot of their research and development work on aero engines. And just over the hill there, on the banks of the canal, Silent Night, the bedding firm, just emerging from their long, controversial industrial dispute. And on the water itself, there's a smaller business, but one that's growing fast. Doug Moore builds canal boats that sell for up to £50,000 a piece. And he's got more customers than he can handle, a longer waiting list than Jaguar cars. And Doug Moore loves this canal. I would like to see, first of all, the canal really maintained. I mean, the, the biggest drawback about the canal as a whole is that for years people have treated it as a dumping ground where it's gone through an industrial area. They haven't realised the benefit of it. And people, there is gradually a reversal of this now where people are beginning to realise that it is an asset, that it is something which can be used and which will enrich their lives. A richer life for Lancashire. That's what the Canal Corridor Scheme will mean. The leader of Lancashire County Council, Louise Elman, sums up the Leeds Liverpool project. Well, it's Lancashire's renaissance. It's showing how eight local authorities, Lancashire Enterprises and the British Waterways Board are prepared to come together on one project that is vital to the future of this region. The community are going to get renewed uh, cities, renewed areas, new jobs, new leisure facilities, new life. And they're also going to get finance back. This is going to be developed commercially is going to be developed by a combination of public and private sector finance and it's going to be organized project by project, town by town in such a way that while the community enjoys better facilities and more jobs there is also to be a financial return on the commercial projects in the scheme. So really I think the pleasure is from seeing the canal corridor as a whole developed and in doing that giving a new future to Lancashire and to the region. over the country, gales in many places, storm force damaging winds in parts of the southwest by that time, and gusts in excess of 60 miles an hour in many parts of the southwest. By midday, those storm force winds extending eastwards across southern districts, severe gales in many places, less windy in the middle, but gales in the far north as well. Those are the mean winds, a very windy day indeed, especially for southern and the far north of Britain. At